Journey started 800 years back in 1215 AD from Yunnan. Sukafa, a Thai prince from Wang Mao, raised by his maternal grandparents, was expected to ascend the throne held by his maternal uncle. However, a late-born son to his uncle ended Sukafa's claim to the throne. His grandmother told him, no two tigers can stay in the same jungle. No two kings can sit on the same throne. So Sukafa set out on a quest to find and establish his own kingdom. With a contingent of 9,000 men, women and children, including his three queens, two sons and a daughter, 300 horses and two elephants, he set out towards the valley beyond the Patkai Hills, a valley that is fertile, inundated, with numerous river tributaries. He goes through an older known road from mid Kena, Mogwa, and the upper Irrawaddy Valley to reach the Nanyang Lake, also known as the Lake of No Return, and the Pangsu Pass at the crest of the Patkai Hills. After an extraordinary journey of 13 years in 1227 AD. Right now, he has the Patkai Hills in front of him, filled with dense rainforest where trees grow up to 100 feet before spreading out their branches to form a dense thick canopy that prevents any sunlight to pass through. Every hour, every second, every day, in and out, every part of this forest pulsates with life. New plants make their march upwards towards the sunlight, their nourishment, to become a big tree and eventually the forest. This same forest are home to numerous mammals, primates, big cats, and reptiles. It's a battle for survival. Every moment you are being prayed by someone or you are praying over someone. This is beautiful. At the same time, it's scary. Seasons change. There's not a moment of stagnation here. We also encounter some elephants in the jungle who are going to be the part of my cavalry in the future. There are also numerous tribes in these hills who have their strong culture and tradition developed over centuries. They are fiercely territorial, ready to defend their villages, parched in the hills in this dense forest. They have numerous dialects, languages, traditions, and festivals. But I have to go beyond this. I crossed a forest. I have to cross the rivers. I crossed the river Sessa. Then the river buried him. 
to eventually reach Nabru in 1228 AD. I send out my informants in all directions to find a reason conducive for wet rice cultivation. Meanwhile, my neighboring kingdoms were the Morans and the Borohis. I have to be careful not to engage with them till I have found a stable capital. After spending a few years in Tipam, Joypur, Namrup, I went along the river towards Habu, where I stayed by cultivation. However, the floods forced us to abandon Habum in 1242 AD. We headed towards Simologuri. We also fought the Morans and the Borohis, defeated them one by one, and then wisely brokered peace. I had numerous skirmishes with the tribesmen from the hills as well. Finally, after wandering from place to place to find a suitable piece of fertile land for wet rice cultivation that can sustain my people, that can sustain my army, my kingdom, I moved into the hills. in Soraidu to establish the first capital of my kingdom in Eventually, after great uh, rejoicing and celebrations, I established uh, my first capital in Soraidu in 1252 AD. This place shall be the holy place for my successors, where they will worship and honor their ancestors. Our spirits will remain in this sacred place. They will build moidams 
all around. Through which we shall enter the afterlife. My successors shall derive their energy, his strength, and dynamism from this place. And right over there will be the sacred pond where our bodies brought out from the preservatory solution will be washed before being laid into the walls with valuables inside the moidams. Over the next few years, over the next few centuries, there will be moidams all around. I hope to remain safe, protected, and respected within the big walls inside these moidams, having domical structure and covered by earthen brick mounds. I, Saulung Sukafa, after an extraordinary journey that started in 1215 AD, entering through the Patkai Hills into the Brahmaputra Valley in 1228 AD, and eventually establishing my first capital in Soraidio in 1252 AD. Today, it is 1268 AD, I pass on the pattern to my successors to build on a strong foundation after my journey that started 53 years ago.
I was still in the womb of my mother. My father Tau Khamti, the erstwhile king, was in the battlefield with neighboring kingdoms, avenging my fraternal uncle's treacherous murder. The elder queen was envious of my mother being father's favorite queen. Execution orders of my mother under false charges were passed. Uh, the nobles, however, took pity and instead of killing directly, left us adrift on a boat in the mighty river Brahmaputra. Uh, my mother was screeching in pain, lonely on a boat. Death was inevitable with me inside her womb, never to see the light of the day. However, maybe destiny had some other plans for me. We somehow reached the other shore in Habum, where my mother died shortly after giving birth to me. In her dying moments, she revealed my royal parentage to our savior, a Brahmin, and she extracted a promise to have me taken care of. He raised me up as if one among his own children. I grew up with everything going on well in Habum. When I was 15, I was taken aback and surprised as I received an invitation from the nobles of Soraydev in the opposite bank of Brahmaputra. With the auspices of the nobles, I was coronated as the king in 1397 in all the regal pomp and the glory. I also brought my adopted family to the capital. However, the news of my succession did not augur well with many of the princes of the other clan families whom the nobles had rejected. From my confidantes, I came to know that the Pamiya chiefs, who are my clan brothers from the country of the Palm, they were plotting against me. Now in my short time as a king, I have realized that in spite of all the glamour, life is perilous indeed. As a monarch, I have to maintain the political and territorial stability. At the same time, I have to be constantly on guard not only against external threats, but from my own kinsmen as well. There are times when you can be poisoned or stamped in the sleep. There is a vast array, rather I would say a panoply of chemicals, poisons and gases that can make death swift and seemingly natural. Now the case of the simmering discontentment and the eventual rebellion of the Tipamiya chiefs needs to be quelled before spiraling out of control. This is also an opportunity to showcase my iron-handedness to prevent future mischiefs and plots. I decide to approach with prudence and an element of surprise. So I announce the event of elephant catching known as Keda with the beating of the drums and amid huge commotion we capture a number of elephants by the stockade method. We invite all the clan members from across the country to partake in the ensuing festivities. The Tipamiya chiefs are also hardly aware of what tragedy would struck upon them. With swiftness in the opportune moment at the height of merriment, I order their on-spot executions on charges of sedition. With the thought of a hangdown, their heads are decapitated and rivulets of blood oozing out in all directions and their bodies is still shaking in breaks and fits. We then have their heads assembled in a heap for display as a trophy and forewarning to all my transgressors. Now, my next challenge came when Surumpha, the king of Munkang, in present-day Myanmar sent his army. This happened when Tai Sulai, a Tipam prince, 
requested his support from Surumpha to overthrow me. In the battle that happened, I personally led the army riding on an elephant against the invaders in the battlefield near Kuhiarbari in the Tipam country. I sustained a slight wound from an enemy spear grazing through me. Eventually the battle turned in our favor and we chased the invaders beyond the hill range. The commander of the Mongkang army, Tasim Pao Borgohai, sought peace, to which the commander of my army, Nang Chukham Borgohai, agreed. The meeting of the Borgohais for the peace treaty negotiations concluded by the Nanyang Lake side in 1401 AD. The Patkai Hill Range was fixed as the boundary between the two countries. A solemn oath of amity was sworn and consecrated by the cutting of a fowl. This historic event is the origin of the word Patkai, as Patkai Sankyu means cut fowl and what swan. After my successful dealing with both external and internal threats, I shifted the capital from Soraidio to Sorgua in 1403 AD. On this occasion, I also for the very first time started the Singhori Ghoruta ceremony, the king's coronation ceremony. Henceforth, this would be performed by my successors as part of coronation. My reign lasted for 10 years from 1397 AD till 1407 AD when I died. I was known as the Bamunik War because of the peculiar circumstances of my birth and my upbringing. Yes, I entered the afterlife very early. But I do keep following the stories and the path taken by my descendants. One of the most illustrious and outstanding reigns was of Suhungmung, who expanded our dominions in all directions, successfully annexing and defending in a strong reign period of 42 years. And he, Suhungmung, ascended the throne in 1497 AD, exactly a century after my ascension in 1397 AD. <laughs> I'm not going to snatch his share of glory. Oh, 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 someday you'll get to listen from the man himself. From Suhungbung himself as he reflects back on his eventful reign. By the way, uh, Suhungbung had shifted the capital to Bokota, near uh, the bank of the Hing. Suhungmung's son, Suklenmung, also led many of the military exploits along with his father on becoming the king after Suhungmung's controversial assassination. Suklenmung shifted the capital to Gorgao in 1540 AD, where he made the royal township into an impregnable fortress surrounded by embankments and water-filled ditches. There is also the Raja's palace the Gorgao Karenghor, an exquisite seven-story royal palace. May you have a halluva time over there. As we stepped out of Soraidio, uh, my thoughts still uh, wandered around Sukafa about the journey that he had undertaken and a strong foundation and vision he had set. I also learned about Bamunikor's story and I was surprised. I thought such tales existed in Grandma's stories as in Aidyor Hadukotha or in uh, mythology. Indeed, uh, reality can surprise you in ways much more stranger and surreal than fiction. With his thoughts, uh, we headed towards 
Gorgao, the royal capital complex established by Sukhlen Mung in 1540 AD. Uh, this solid road is the historic Todar Ali Road built in 1687 AD by the then Ahom King Godadar Hingho. It is 212 kilometers long beginning from Komargao in the Golaghat district, touching Morioni in Jorhat district and ending at Joypur in Dibrugarh district. And according to stories, uh, the king had mobilized some thoughts, which means uh, lazy men, to build it. A very good way to put people into action indeed. So coming back to the royal capital complex, uh, it was fortified with three layers of rectangular rampart and uh, some is word for rampart being God. And since this was a heavily fortified uh, royal capital complex, it was known as the Gorgao. Now beyond this railing wall besides the road is uh, actually a water body, a moat, beyond which we can see the outer rampart known as the Bajgar or the Bahigar. Now there has been an excessive growth of planktonic algae that has clouded the surface of this moat making it uh, less uh, aesthetically uh, pleasing. Now the Bajgar, the outer rampart was 25 feet high and 20 feet wide which is constituting mainly of bamboo groves of a very thorny and thick species, the Kutuhaba, and which was impenetrable even by cannon shells. And this particular mode is a ditch filled with water, is uh, 55 to 75 feet wide and 20 to 28 feet uh, deep. So we are on the historic Todar Ali Road, approaching the royal capital complex through the main entrance, Bordwar, which was heavily guarded and through which only kings, nobles and high officials were allowed entry. There used to be cannons and uh, bore tubes at this entry point on either side of the gate. As we enter and cross the first layer of ramparts, the Bajkar, on both sides of the road uh, existed houses made of finely curved wood. These houses were known as machans and they used to rest on, on a platform atop wooden pillars as the ground was very damp. Beautiful gardens, white lush lawns and orchards dotted the landscape. The nobles had also built their plush residences. We are heading towards the intersection of the three roads each coming from the three entry points of this royal capital complex. The left one is coming from Nordwar in the west and the right one is coming from Panidwar in the east. And if you go straight, you will cross the inner rampart, then reach the brick rampart within which lies the current hall. So this is the aerial view where we can see the boardwalk through which we have entered. We have taken the exactly the same road to reach the intersection point of the three roads. Through the north war in the west, officials uh, of the ranks Hazorikas, Fukons and Soikyas were allowed entry. And also during the time of the war, uh, the north war would serve as the rallying point for heading out to the battlefield. Whereas through the Panidwar, common residents were allowed entry. Movement was uh, monitored in this heavily guarded complex. Uh, the second layer of fortification is the inner rampart within which uh, there is a brick rampart as you can see that houses the seat of administrative power, the Karenghar. The inner rampart was also in the form of bamboo plantations surrounded by moats. So from this intersection point we head towards the inner rampart area. There are plus residential houses with thatched straw roofs People were dressed in finely woven embroidered silk whose fame spread far and wide. Every house was self-sufficient with its food granaries, stocking years of replenishment after every harvest season. Bitter leaves and unripe areca nuts, known as pantamul basically, they were popular even uh, in those days.
So we take the steps uh, towards the Karen Ghar, the seven-storied palace with three floors below the ground. The king's uh, plus residence was also somewhere nearby and uh, it was heavily guarded by his set of bodyguards known as Saudangs. Uh, from this uh, current car, uh, there is a secret tunnel also, 16 kilometers long, which uh, connected it to the Tolatal Ghar in Rangpur, Hibohagar. And somewhere used to be the majestic audience hall of the king, known as the Hulanghar, which was 60 meters in length and 15 meters wide, resting on 66 wooden pillars. Each of those pillars, 2 meters in circumference, were beautifully wood carved. When the drummers would beat their drums, all the residents would assemble and throng in this audience hall where the Raja would be seated on his throne beneath a set of nine finely woven, beautiful canopies of varying hues and colors arranged one above the other. Fine wooden trellis work would embellish the sides of this Hulanghar. Few travelers have also mentioned about brass mirrors polished so finely that sunbeams dazzled and flashed. Some of the travelers have witnessed the king seated on a throne of gold. The grandeur and his splendor could only have been experienced. With words always falling far short to capture the sublime feeling that might have been evoked in the premises of this palace. The columns in its heydays were lined with gold and silver strips inlaid in ivory. The ceilings were adorned with sheets of gold. I wonder how beautiful it might have been. However, what remains is a mere fraction of what was in its heyday. Much of this royal capital complex was destroyed during internal rebellions. Then the Man occupation followed by annexation to the East India Company under the Treaty of Yandabo in 1826. A significant portion was broken down for want of construction materials for public works when it was under the British occupation.
This is stairways, the pillars ahead. These corridors, these passageways, these halls have witnessed a long succession of kings, nobles, high end officials have given their counsels and also exercised their power within the halls within the chambers many a kings queens nobles have either designed or themselves fallen to the intrigues within the confines of this royal palace but the kingdom moves on and survives with some of the kings leaving their indelible marks with their vision penchant for action and ability to maneuver to the facade of plots in the year 1662 AD at the peak of the Ahom Mughal conflicts after the ascension of Aurangzeb on the Mughal throne Mir Jumla was appointed as the subedar of Bengal Mir Jumla born in Persia to the family of a merchant he worked as a clerk in the kingdom of Golconda before he rose through the ranks to become a wazir. He soon went under the services of the Mughal Empire and being in the good books of Aurangzeb who was impressed with him. He was entrusted with the important task of dealing with Shah Shuja, the brother of Aurangzeb and a rival contender to the Mughal throne. Mir Jumla chased Shah Suja to the present-day Myanmar and then set his eyes towards Assam, marching with 12,000 cavalry, 30,000 infantry, and a fleet of 323 ships and boats up the river Brahmaputra. His naval contingent comprised of Portuguese, English, and Dutch sailors. In about six weeks, he reached from Gohati to Gorgao, the capital of the Ahom Kingdom. The shallow river forced him to dock his vessels, ships in Lakhov, some 30 kilometers northwest from Gorgao. He entered Gorgao on 17th of March 1662, which was by then already evacuated by the king, shifting his valuables on a convoy of elephants and by the river routes on a flotilla of thousand boats, first to Soraideo and then to Namru. Namrup was a safe haven, inaccessible with harsh terrain and highly inclement weather. The gusto and enthusiasm with which Mir Jumla came soon gave away to dismay as the lashing rains with the onset of monsoon from May to October saw his food supplies wedding at an astonishing rate. The roads and the fields had become awfully muddy and flooded with water rendering the Mughal cavalry useless. Almost two-thirds of his army perished to waterborne diseases and epidemics. Guerrilla attacks in the night by the inhabitants had unleashed a reign of terror among his men unused to such terrain and weather. Desperate to return back, much to his relief, a treaty was signed in Khilajhari Ghat Tipam on January 1663 and May Jumla headed back to Dhaka with a loot of 82 elephants, 1,000 odd boats, 300,000 rupees, gunpowder, 675 pieces of artillery and 6,750 matchlocks. Joydwar Singh, the erstwhile Ahom king, was struck in deep grief. Under the terms of the treaty, he had to part away with his six-year-old daughter Ramoni Gabharu to the imperial harem. Sons of various chiefs, nobles were sent as hostages. Soraideu, the sacred ancestral abode, was violated in search of plunder. His kingdom was obligated to pay the tribute of gold, silver, and elephants, sullied by the title of Bhogonia Roja for having fled the capital to seek safe refuge in Namru. He died with a deep wedge in his heart and a veil of gloom and utter hopelessness pervading the kingdom. 
He was succeeded by Supangmung, alias Chakradwas Singha, the Saring Rosa. Supangmung was the great grandson of Suhungmung, one of the most powerful kings in their history. Chakradwas Singh had an uphill task in front of him to inspire confidence in the demotivated troops, to rise from the fall to disgrace, and like his great grandfather Suhungmung, Chakradwas Singha with his persona of dynamism and determination. He takes us a pledge and he says, only the calm before the impending storm, before the Levi breaks. My ancestors were never subordinate to any other people. The great Saolong Sukafa laid the foundations of the empire 400 odd years ago after a heroic journey full of adventures a peak in scale. My great grandfather Suhungmu with his immense skill, dynamism and resourcefulness led us to monumental victories expanded our territories. We have always successfully defended external invasions, defeating the Mughals numerous times in the past. But now, in my lifetime, we have reached the Nadi. The last few years, the Mughals dealt a heavy blow to us. My army has suffered a defeat, and the morale of my people is low. My pride, my shattered pride, and the place of my ancestors, the sacred Soraidu, has been desecrated. The humiliating agreements and treaties that I had to sign. I cannot withstand the grave humiliation from the Mughal Empire. At least, not on my watch. That is preferable to dishonor. I need to redeem myself. I have to restore the lost glory. I have to do my atonement. I'll build a stronger army, a stronger navy. I'll create strong supply lines of food, arms, ammunition, and artillery. I'll strengthen the riverine naval dockyards along the river Brahmaputra and the numerous tributaries. With the boat making centers at Hadirasau, Pandu, Ramdia, Sualkusi, Kozolimuk, Koliabar, Bishsonath, Samdhara, Hodia, and Dikhomuk. I'll build boats of varying shapes and also heavy war boats with a special chambalud. I'll fortify the walls and the ramparts of my palaces. I'll dig deep ditches along the rampart walls and fill it with water and crocodiles. At the river waterfront, I'll build fortifications, the panigors, where inside the water I'll place hedges of trees, bamboos and sharp prickly thorns. I'll use the knowledge of the unique geography and the weather to defeat the Mughals. I have to restore the pride and the glory. It's going to take time, but I'll be patient. But I am sure, eventually, with my commander-in-chief, the brave heart Lochit Barfukan, and the highly skilled diplomat, Prime Minister Oton Buragohai, with our soldiers, with their bravery, with our modernized weaponry and the tactics, will bring war to the waterfront and will eventually oust the Mughals who have vanquished Tapia the kingdom nearby. I'll redeem myself. 